Hey guys, it's History Behind the Warrior, and welcome to yet another God of War video. Now, just before I do a quick intro into what this video is about, I just wanted to say huge thank you to all of you for all of the support with the new content on the channel. It's something new and different, and I know it's not quite for everyone, but I still really appreciate you all taking the time of day to watch what I do here. It honestly does mean a lot for me. But with that said, let's actually discuss what today's video Video is all about. With us all still coming off the hype of the Ragnarok trailer, and us itching closer and closer to the Game Awards, wink wink nudge nudge, I wanted to talk about the Norse series of games and, well, Ragnarok itself, because the coming God of War installment is supposed to be the climax of the Norse series of games. In saying that, however, we are still missing a few key players for the climactic battle of Ragnarok. So, with the end days on the horizon, in today's video, I will be discussing the gods and monsters we are yet to see in the God of War universe, their roles in said climactic battle, and how this could unravel in game. It's also worth mentioning here that many of the characters here are still shrouded in mystery, as we are yet to see them in game or be revealed in the game's promotional material. But before we start, if possible please do give this video a thumbs up as it really really does support the channel and helps give it that extra push. And if you like what we do here and wish to go that extra step, please do not forget to subscribe and tick that bell as it will keep you up to date with all of my content, including the history of Freya which will be coming out Sunday. So without any further ado, let's begin shall we? Now to kick off this video, it only felt right that if we are talking about legendary characters of Norse mythology, that we touch on one that we are yet to see in the God of War universe, but have heard so so much of, the genocidal tyrant king of Asgard, Odin. Odin is a grand deity in the God of War universe, being slayer of Ymir and father of many prominent figures in Norse mythology, the Allfather's reach and influence is limitless as he oversees the realms watching waiting and listening, as he is ultimately trying his best to avert Ragnarok. But the Allfather wasn't always this tyrannical, at least not to this extent. Odin is a warrior king and leader of his people, the Aesir. The Aesir are a warrior race that thrives in battle and really embodies that viking fighting spirit. They fought as hard as they drank and did, for the longest time, battle against all that stood in their way. The biggest foes and enemies were the Vanir gods of Vanaheim and the giants of Jotunheim. Now, fortunately, in time, these issues would be put aside as Odin would marry Freya of Vanaheim and peace was temporarily ushered across the Nine Realms. But once Odin learned of Ragnarok, and his destined fate to perish on its final day, the Raven King went insane. Odin would search tooth and nail across the Nine Realms for a possible solution for his imminent demise, but in the end, he found no success. And in time, Odin's grip on his sanity would slowly snap. One day, he exploded into a fit of rage when he was denied by the Jotuns of their ability to look into the future. Unhinged and broken, Odin would now see the Jotuns as his true enemy, and the Mad King would send his son Thor to Midgard so he could unleash a bloody massacre across the realm. That day, the realm of Midgard would be drenched in the blood of Jotuns, and a new era would be ushered into the Nine Realms the reign of the mad Raven King. But Odin wouldn't stop here. His paranoia and spite would even turn him against his own, as when Freya left him, he would incarcerate her to Midgard, where she would forever be trapped, outcasted by both Aesir and Vanir gods. To further add insult to injury, he would even imprison her Valkyrie sisters, locking them deep in vaults scattered across the realms. Next would be the ambassador of the realms, Mimir he would seal him into an unbreakable tree, leaving him there for over 100 winters and torturing him at every opportunity. The malicious nature of Odin only grew day by day. The next would even be his kin, his son, Tyr. 
the god of war. Unlike his Greek god of war counterparts, Tyr was a strong advocate of peace amongst the Nine Realms, and even beyond that. He believed in building bridges opposed to burning them down, and because of this, Odin saw his own son as a threat, and after he assisted the frost giants in escaping Midgard, the Aesir god would be captured and imprisoned in an unknown location for a very, very long time. The All Father would even spread the rumor of his son's demise to ward off those that may follow in his footsteps or even challenge him. Tyr's disappearance was a message, and it was one that the realms heeded well. From here, Odin would sliver into the depths of his throne room, having his children and even their children become his enforcers. They hunted all that opposed him, but there would be one, one in all of the nine realms that shook Odin to his core, the ghost of Sparta himself. Kratos. The Spartan was not part of the prophecy he had foreseen. Kratos' arrival had brought on the event of the apocalypse 100 winters early, so the end would be nigh for the All Father. And from what we see in the trailer, it looks like it's all hands on deck against the former Olympian, with Odin sending out the Almighty Four and even the warriors of Valhalla to hopefully prevent destiny. But with us now done talking about Odin, you probably we already know who we have to talk about now, Fenrir, son of Loki and prophesied killer of the Allfather. Now Fenrir in the God of War universe is very different to that of his mythological counterpart, as it seems like the Great Wolf has been sent back in time, opposed to of being born in the present. But before we go into the finer details of this version of Fenrir, let's talk about Fenrir in Norse mythology, and then his God of War counterpart, so we can compare the two, as Tyr is actually a very important part of this story. Now as mentioned, Fenrir is a child of Loki and Angraboda. He is just one of their three children, which are Jormungandr and Hel. The trio, for the longest amount of time, were kept in secrecy, but eventually word would break out, and the trio would be brought before Odin. Knowing that the children of Loki would only spell misfortune for Asgard, they would be cast out. Hel would be given domain of Helheim, the underworld of God and Man. Jormungandr would be tossed into the lands of Midgard, and Fenrir would be kept in Asgard, as the All Father wanted to keep a close eye on the wolf. Of all of Loki's children, it was Fenrir that striked fear into his heart. Day by day, the wolf dramatically grew in both size and power, and eventually it got to the point where the gods could no longer ignore the imminent threat before them. So to halt the beast, the gods would forge chains to imprison him, goading him into wearing them as a test of his strength. Strong and nimble, the chains would snap on two separate occasions, but it would be the third one where the gods would have success. With the assistance of dwarves, they were finally able to create an unbreakable ribbon, one that the great wolf could not escape. But Fenrir, now suspicious, having sensed foul play from the Aesir gods, would refuse to be bound by them once again. But this is where Tyr appeared. Tyr, having cared for the wolf in Asgard, came up with a deal. He said he would place his hand in the wolf's mouth as he was bound by the chains. If at any point Fenrir suspected that something was wrong, then Fenrir, with Tyr's permission, would be allowed to eat his hand. While still unsure, his faith in Tyr proved to be his downfall. Once bound, the wolf could not snap the ribbons. In fact, every time he attempted to break them, they only grew tighter, and thus Fenrir, in a fit of rage and disgust, would consume the hand of Tyr. The Asgardians would cast him out, no longer seeing Fenrir as a threat. But of course, they couldn't have been more wrong. All they did was fuel Fenrir's own spite and hatred towards the Aesir. So, in the coming days of Ragnarok, the wolf would eventually break free of his shackles and arrive in Asgard to bring on its doom. He would then eventually go on to fulfill his prophecy of killing Odin before he himself does perish. With that said, what do we know of Fenrir and the God of War universe? Well, honestly, it's kind of muddled. 
In the series, as of right now, he has been alluded to more than anything, but there are key characters in his story that we do know currently exist in the universe. So it gives us a rough gist of what's going on. In the 2018 game, we do know that Fenrir is indeed very, very much so alive. So much like his sibling, Jormungandr, he has been sent back in time to play a part in the events leading up to Ragnarok or the battle itself. What we do also know is that Fenrir during this time, courtesy of information from murals and our favourite severed head, Mimir, the wolf is supposedly located in the kennels of Asgard. As before the events of the 2018 game, Fenrir has had two children, Skull and Hati, the wolves that chase the sun and moon. It looks like Odin may have captured Fenrir so he can take advantage of the wolf's kin, as the two wolves are fated to consume the sun and the moon during Ragnarok. So once again, it is another desperate attempt by Odin to control Ragnarok. What's also interesting to touch on is that we don't really know if Fenris has been bound to chains yet. We know that the chains most certainly exist, as it has been mentioned in game that Brock and Sindri had forged unbreakable chains, so it does loosely imply that they could have already been used. But that also being said, in bits of promotional material, Tyr still has his hand, so it leads to many questions here of what exactly is going on. As we know, Ragnarok is acting in a loop. So this could very, very well be a case where Fenrir has been sent back into the past with the purpose of dying so his children can exist and Atreus later down the line can father the young Fenris into the beast who is destined to kill Odin. Ugh, time travel. But also, I could easily be overanalyzing things as he could simply be bound and chained in Asgard prior to the events of the 2018 game. With Tyr yet to have his hand eaten, it raises a lot of questions with Fenrir, but either option is really plausible here, as the Norse series of games is loosely based off its source material, so I don't expect them to follow everything step by step. Now with Fenris covered, let's move on to our next character, and it will be the god of foresight and wielder of the Galahorn, Heimdall. Now whilst not quite at the caliber of Odin or Thor, Heimdall is definitely not an Asgardian that should be overlooked. Bearing knowledge and sight equal to that of Odin, with the Aesir's fighting spirit, he is a formidable opponent for any adversary. But why am I bringing him up here? Well it is he who sounds the Galahorn once the gates of Asgard is attacked and breached, and during this battle it is he who would go on to fight Loki and eventually slay the trickster before he does succumb to his wounds. With that said, what do we know of Heimdall in the God of War universe? Well, honestly not very much at all, as he's only very, very briefly mentioned once in the entire game by Sindri. However, with his role as the protector of Asgard's Bifrost Gate, it would be no surprise to see him involved in the coming battle. The main reason as to why I'm even putting Heimdall on this list is because I'm very interested here to see the possible clash between him and Atreus, as the young man is still definitely learning of his godhood and his capabilities as a trickster. Now onto our next big character, and it is yet another child of Loki, the goddess of death, Hel. If you are even slightly familiar with Norse mythology, you've already probably heard of her or had a glimpse of her in modern day pop culture. Looking at you, Marvel. Whilst Hel herself doesn't play as much of a prominent role as her siblings in Ragnarok, she still is a very important aspect of the battle. In Norse mythology, once she's cast into Helheim, being forced to become its ruler, Hel would prepare her own plans of vengeance against the Allfather, even denying him the return of his son Baldur after his death by Loki. As Ragnarok begins, she would lend her forces to aid her father in battle, even giving a ship to the giant Frim as Asgard's walls fall. So while she plays a role in this battle, she herself isn't there in person. So fun fact, Hel is one of the very few people that do not die in this battle because of this. In the God of War universe though, we don't really have much to work with. Whilst yes, we have explored Helheim twice, we are yet to see the goddess of death herself. But with her siblings already being present in the universe, I can't imagine she's too far behind 
I believe she has purposely been concealing herself for when she needs to make her presence known. And with Border dead, we could very well see a former Asgardian of sorts maybe reach out to Hell and try to bargain with her. We simply have to wait and see, as all of the Nine Realms will be accessible in the following game. Now, our next and final character is Serta. Serta is without a doubt one of the strongest enemies in Norse mythology, being one of the very first beings to have come into existence. The fire giant and ruler of Muspelheim is a formidable force of nature, as his strength and power is important to not just Ragnarok, but the Norse cycle itself. What I mean by this is that in Norse mythology, Surtur possesses a unique form of power known as the Primordial Flame. This is an extremely powerful enchantment imbued with his sword that has the ability to renew the cycle of the Nine Realms. So in short, the Primordial Flame in Surtur's blade is pivotal in both the destruction and rebirth of Asgard. Being aware of his own fate in this battle, the fire giant remains in the depths of Muspelheim training every single day so that when the time comes he is more than ready. Aware of his death by the hand of Thor and Odin, he knows that this is not truly the end as the cycle will always come to pass. Thus, in a way, his victory is assured as he renews it at every turn. Now back to the God of War universe, what do we know of Surtur here? Well, we know very little of the fire giant as most of our interactions with him are with his sword than Muspelheim, and while Muspelheim itself is more of a challenge arena than it is an area, so we never get to explore it properly or meet him. But what we know of Surtur is that his character is very, very close to his mythological counterpart, so he is waiting and binding his time for the Day of Reckoning. And with God of War Ragnarok taking place during Fimble Winter, it is only a matter of time before we see him. But sadly, this is all that we do know of the Fire Giant and the rest of the pivotal characters for Ragnarok in the God of War universe. I hope you've enjoyed this one, as it's been a pretty chunky video. We've dealt with quite a lot of information. Trust me, I know. I have to read all of these back and record them, but in saying that, I really do hope you've come away learning more. There are many bits and pieces that go into Ragnarok, and many of us may not be familiar with it, or need a little bit of a recap before we get on to the next game. I'm sure I possibly missed some bits and pieces, as well Ragnarok is such a crazy big event, but here I wanted to talk about the prominent figures of the event, so that way we know what to keep an eye out for in the next game. I am a bit sad that this will be the climax of the Norse series of the God of War games, but with how things have been set up and there already being talks about exploring other pantheons, the future of the series looks very bright, and I cannot wait to see how this game unravels. With that said, which of the characters I've mentioned here are you the most excited to see in Ragnarok? Please do comment down below. But until then, stay strong, stay well, and keep on fighting, as Ragnarok comes for us all. Take care everyone.